Welcome to episode 19 of the Film Inventories podcast. This is Jamie Benning speaking to you from my house here in London. If you're new to the podcast, I hope you find this both interesting and rewarding. Essentially what I'm doing here is creating an archive of interviews with craftspeople in the film industry. Some of them are very much retired, while others are still actively working. The thing that links them all are those seminal movies of the 70s, 80s and 90s like Jaws, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Back to the Future, Blade Runner. I didn't mention any 90s films there, but I'll be tackling some of those in upcoming episodes. Do go back and check out some of the previous episodes in which I've spoken to an Oscar-winning editor, an Oscar-winning sound designer, special effects supervisor, an actor, a stunt performer, several puppeteers, an industrial designer with some great stories about his time working on both Star Wars and Star Trek, as well as some hilarious ones about Howard the Duck. For this episode, episode 19, I've returned to Jaws. If you don't already know my work, from 2006 to 2014, I created some feature-length documentaries, or filmumentaries as I called them, on some of my favourite films. These filmumentaries take the film timeline as you know it, but I masterfully edit in commentary, behind-the-scenes video, deleted scenes, text facts, animations, and so on, to, to flesh out the story of the making of the movie. My intention was to create a new way to experience the making of a movie. I was fed up with those kind of bog-standard making of documentaries. Inside Jaws is still available for free on Vimeo.com. In fact, all of my work is free, partly thanks to the very kind patrons on Patreon. More on that at the end of the podcast. So last weekend, here in February 2021, I spoke to the legendary production designer Joe Alves. Joe collaborated with Steven Spielberg on a number of projects, going back to Steven's years in television, But I spoke to him about the origins of uh, his job in the industry, as well as his time on Jaws and Close Encounters. I should also note that Joe has a book called Joe Al's Production Designer. It's written by Dennis L. Prince, with a foreword by effects artist Greg Nicotero. Thanks as always for your questions, suggestions. This time those thanks go to DG Adoy, Benjamin Cruz, though I did ignore your question. (laughs) James H. Dargy, Ed Clark, Scott H., Newbie DM, and Tom Quinn. I didn't get a chance to ask all of them, but I appreciate you getting in touch and also by helping me to form my ideas ahead of the interview. So here's my chat with Joe Alves, production designer on Jaws and Close Encounters, and I'll be back at the end for a bit more jabbering on. Joe, can you tell me how you got started in the film industry? What was the uh, what was the origins of your your journey and your career? I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, and I went to uh, a college, uh, San Jose State. When I was uh, in high school, I played the piano, and I had a little combo, and I used to, and I could always draw. I was from the time I was, you know, four years old, and I think when I was in the fourth grade, I drew all the dwarfs, you know about this size. So when I was in high school, I was the head of the poster committee and I played piano. Um, So um, then I went to college and I decided I wanted to do film. You know, it was an interesting thing. I had seen uh, American in Paris and um, with a little girl down the street and we came home dancing away. And then I found out the movie wasn't made in Paris. It It was actually made on the back lot and it was an art director, art directors that did this, you know. And uh, so I thought, boy, that's what I want to do. So I, I figured I needed to know architecture and art. So I majored in architecture, minored in, in drama. And I was in a play. And then uh, there was a sign that kept saying Los Angeles, you know, as I was driving to. And I said, someday I'm going to make that turn and go down to L.A. and get in the film business. I did, and I went to a very good art school, Chouinard's, that specialized in production design. And so my, and I was very young because I graduated, I just turned 17 a month. So all through my senior year, I was only 16. And uh, so I'm in art school down there and my cousin's an architect uh, living down there and he helps me out uh, with architectural things. So the summer comes and, uh, 
I don't want to move back to San Francisco. I want to stay in LA and get a job there for the summer. But when I was in college, I was in a fraternity and one of my fraternity brothers, I, I went and I saw him. He says, uh, well, you know, my, my wife's father works at Disney. Maybe you can get a job at Disney's. And I thought, okay, so I called up and it just happened. He was the guy that did the hiring. I mean, what luck. So he said, well, bring in your portfolio. I, mean, I just turned 19. And I said, well, I, you know, I thought I'd go sweep up or, you know, work around the stages. He said, no, bring your portfolio. So I brought my portfolio in and he said, uh, yeah, good. Uh, he said, uh, you're, you're too late for the training program. Was 40 days, they teach you how to do Mickey Mouse and stuff like that. He said, but I could put you in special effects right away. You know, where you do fire and water and all those effects. So I go into this room and there's this woman, Marion, I remember her name, and there's these tables with this glass thing, you know, and, and paper with three holes in it and you put it in there. And I said, well, what do you, what do I do? I mean, I, this is my trade, nothing. She said, you flip the pages and draw in between. So, okay, I'm a trainee. And you go from a trainee after about 40, 50 days to uh, an in-betweener. And after a couple of years, you become a breakdown artist. And then another couple of years, you become assistant animator. And then it goes on, you become an animator. Well, so she's working for Dwight Carlisle, who's a, an older assistant. And he's working for Josh Metter, who is the king. He did the fire in Bambi, he did a, the and, uh, night in Bald Mountain, all these things. And he was working on a picture for MGM called Forbidden Planet and he was drawing the id. And so she was working for his assistant and I'm doing whatever they give me. And then after a couple of weeks, she has to leave. So I start working directly to with Dwight. So I go from a trainee to an, a breakdown artist within a, a month or two, you know, it's just incredible. And I'm working with him and we're starting to draw the id and we're in a test technoscope paper, which is wide, big, wide, you know, cause it was, uh, the format. And I'm working with Dwight, who's working for Josh. And a month into it, and Dwight's got to, I mean, yeah, Dwight's got to go to the hospital. So now I'm assisting Josh Minner. After a couple of months, I'm, I am drawing the id. And so uh, that was, uh, that's how it started. And Josh was a great artist when he, when he wasn't, uh, you know, he'd take breaks and go paint. He'd paint it with his palette knife. So and then after that, I was working on Sleeping Beauty. And this is an interesting sort of thing. Because of the state of the situation that I'm, I'm drawing a cookie, one of the fairies is holding a cookie. This guy reaches over my table. And he said, No, no, the cookie should look like this, look more like Mickey Mouse's ears, you know, and it was Walt Disney. And you know, and everybody, you called him Walt. I said, oh, okay, thank you, Walter. And so th that was sort of, I mean, here I'm this kid, 19, and Walt Disney is correcting my drawings, you know. And I had a couple of occasions to, to talk to Walt uh, when uh, the head animator said, well, take this up to the director and see, you know, if he, they like it. And, and I did, and Walt would be there and said, let me have that. Oh, no, you do this. So that was, that was my beginning of the movie business. And I was there for, uh, Jamie, for about uh, two years, but I really wanted to get into live action. So uh, I tried to get a job right away, but uh, what happened was uh, in the meantime, I got a job with a very high level decorator in Beverly Hills. We are working on uh, Liberace's house and all these, and I, I, he hired me to do illustrations. So I did that and that helped me get the set kind of things. And I did that, but this friend of mine who uh, actually directed me in a, a play in college, he went to the service for a couple of years. He came back and he got a job at Disney and he started directing plays at the Hollywood Playhouse. And uh, uh, so I did a lot of sets, th theatrical sets. So I did, uh, the uh, illustrations and the working drawings. Vincent Camby, we were doing the big knife. 
and we did a different kind of thing where we actually wanted to co coordinate the movie uh, and a play. So we had Marion, the wife of the character, Jack Palance played in the movie. We photographed her driving from Malibu to Beverly Hills. And then she walks into this door and I match the door, but we have a screen. And so we're watching this movie. And then as she comes to the door on the screen, this, the screen goes up and she comes through a matching door and we're in the set for this little theater. Vincent Canby, he, he thought that was just incredible, you know, and he he wants to talk to me. I said, the director, the director wasn't, no, no, I want to talk to the designer. So he said, I like that idea. I'm going to steal it when I redo this play in Broadway. So here I am again, very, very fortunate. Uh, anyway, long story short, if I could make it short, I find out from an art director how I get a job and I have to start as a junior set designer. In those days, it was very specific. It was a studio system. And, you know, there was head of production, uh, head of all these departments and head art director, and they would assign you what job you did. But uh, so I, I, I'm going around as a junior set designer. You got to wait till everybody else is hired. And then, and so Bob Kenoshita, uh, he was doing a thing, uh, a television show at a studio called Ziv. And he was doing Man in Space. And I started working with him as a set designer until that finished. And then I got a job at 20th Century Fox, who was doing On the Terrace. And so you're hired, you're the last one to hire, the first one to be fired until you're seniority. And then I went to MGM, I worked on uh, Mutiny on the Bounty, The Boat, that Marlon Brando did. And then I, that was through, I went to Warner Brothers. I uh, worked on Ocean's Eleven, uh, My Fair Lady, and it, it was just incredible. Uh, anyway, finally, I became a senior, and that's when I was at Universal. And, and then uh, fr from that, uh, I, I worked on, on the, God, there's so many movies. Uh, but uh, in any case, then I worked myself up uh, as a, a, a senior. Uh, eventually, I got a job uh, as an assistant art director. And that got me into that position. Wow. What a journey. I mean, some of those films you mentioned there, you know, such iconic films. You obviously were born at the right time, Joe. You know, you, you went into, you were lucky, you know, that studio system was still in existence then. There was a proper ladder to climb, unlike unlike today. So when did you, um, I know you worked with Steven Spielberg on Sugarland Express, but when did you first meet Steven? Uh, probably my biggest break as an art director uh as an assistant, and then I became an art director on uh, Night Gallery, Rod Serling's Night Gallery. And Stephen did a Night Gallery. And then when that season was over, we did a show called The Psychiatrist. They only lasted uh, six episodes, but Stephen did two. And we got to know each other. Now, Stephen was very, very clever, but he was not familiar with the studio system and who did what. And I remember one time he, he had a crowd of people, extras, and he would say, oh, say this, say this. And the, you know, production managers are going crazy because every time somebody said a word, that put the rate to three times more. You know? right. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so Stephen wasn't familiar with the procedure. You know, Anyway, I was uh, went on to do Night Gallery. And then, uh, he did uh, another some television movies, and then he got this uh, movie uh, with Goldie Hawn, uh, Sugarland Express. And so then uh, the heads of the de department said, oh, well, Joe's worked with this young guy, you know, put them together. So that's the way it was. Uh, Jaws was a different thing. So I got a good relationship with, with Stephen, but on a sh very small, low budget movie, were two big producers, uh, Zanuck and Brown, and uh, Dick Zanuck and David Brown. And they had done uh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, the, the Sting. So I got to know Dick Zanuck pretty well because on Sugarland, we drove for miles, you know, to find locations in Texas. You know, things were uh, quite different 
before CGI. I mean, you we did that we did that movie, and then uh, I'm working on a television movie, and I get a call from David Brown, which was pretty unusual because I'm sort of like a new art director, and this guy's big. I mean, his wife was Helen Gurley Brown, who was an editor of Cosmopolitan magazine, and she got this galley sheets of a book called Jaws. And she knew Peter Benchley, she knew the family, the Benchley family. And so David called me and he, he said, you know, I want to try to, she told David, I think this will make a good movie. So he called me, he said, you know, Joe, to, for me to sell this to the studio, it would be helpful if you could make me some storyboards, sketches. They're in the book, the big charcoal sketches, which was sort of unusual. And, and basically you're supposed to, Art director could do a, a few sketches, illustrations, and if you're going to do a lot, then you need to hire an illustrator. That's a different union. But uh, he, he said he didn't have a charge number, so he couldn't pay. I mean, I guess they didn't want to pay out of their own money. So I went to the head of the art department, and he said, fine, if it's for Zanuck and Brown, but just keep doing your other work too, you know. So in between, checking the sets for the Double Indemnity, I think was the movie. And um, I would start doing these illustrations. So I would go over to Steven, I said, you know, this shark movie is going to be, he says, I, 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 uh, I wanted to do a pirate movie or something, you know, which he did later. And in any case, uh, what happened, and I'll try to make this quick, I did about, about 30, illustrations. And uh, Stephen, then Zanuck and Brown, they, oh, they had another guy first. And he kept calling the shark a whale. And they said, oh, wait a minute. no, no, this, this is a shark, not a whale. It's not Moby Dick. Uh, so uh, eventually they, they brought Stephen on. And, and there was a big meeting in Marshall Green, who was a head of production. In that meeting, there was Zanuck and Brown and Stephen, and then the various department heads, head of art department, editing, camera, and special effects. So uh, after I did my big display, and you know the shark does this, and Stephen and I decided if we're going to do this, we're going to do a big shark, like 25 feet, in the real ocean. Not in, because we, we watched some of these movies and they did it in the back lot in the lake with a phony backdrop. Real ocean, big shark, no miniature. So I explained that to the effects department because Marshall says, okay, what, what do you guys, and they said, oh, we can't do it. Uh, it, it it's going to take a, a year, year and a half. No one's ever done it, a big thing like that in the real ocean. Besides, we have bigger movies like the Hindenburg, you know. And Marshall got a little upset because Marshall lived on a boat, so I think he liked this idea. And uh, he said, Jaws could be a bigger movie than the Hindenburg. And people laughed. Of course it wasn't. Hindenburg was a big movie, you know. Anyway, basically, we're wrapping up the meeting. I'm getting my drawings in my portfolio. And I started to walk out, and Marshall calls me back, and he says, can you get the shark made? which normally is not an art director's job. Just get it made, but take it away from the studio. Do it independently, find some people to make it. So it gave me total autonomy to go make the shark, which is sort of unusual. So basically that's how that started. And then I started researching sharks and then I hired a number of people. I went to um, Walt Disney and I said, could you make the shark? And they said, yes, because they made a whale, but we won't take it in the ocean. I said, that's not gonna work. And then uh, Joe Lombardi, who did the Godfather movies, uh, he is pretty high up there. And, jo and he says, Joe, th this will take a, a good year, a year and a half to make. And I got some other projects I can't do. Eventually I found Bob Matty, who was sort of retired, who, who had done the giant squid in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And Bob was incredible. And in the book, you see a little wire thing that he made. Uh, and he said, let me think about it. He came back a couple of days with this wire sculpture. You pull the thing, the mouth opens. And he says, that's basically it. We'll control it with valves and we'll, you know, 
and we'll use hydraulics, not pneumatics, because in the ocean, you don't break and then you have oil all over. So anyway, uh, basically that was it. And then we got, got a team, Bob uh, Roy Arbogast, who was really very into the new plastics and stuff and a few other guys. And then I, I got an ecclesiologist, Leonard Campagno from Steinhardt Institute. And uh, we worked together. I did a sculpture, which is in the book, about four feet. And we made it six times that. And, and so uh, that's basically how Jaws started. All of that, that idea about how to do it in the ocean and, uh, you know, to do it as a, as a, as a physical full size prop, not a miniature, was also dependent on finding a location that you could do it in, right? Was that part of your job as well, Joe? Because I know you scouted the location, obviously, for Amity, but was, was the location for the, for the shark also um, yeah. down to you? I had a, a map of the area because I met with Peter Benchley. And I asked him where he wrote this for. And he says, Stony, Genocide, Harbor, various places, but nothing specific. And, uh, and as uh, I said, well, he says, go to uh, Nantucket and you meet my parents and blah, blah, blah. That's great. So I said, what about this other island, Mather's Vineyard? And he said, no, he'd never been there, but he didn't think there was anything. Anyway, long story short, I started to go to Nantucket, water was too rough, the boat turned around and there was a boat to Martha's Vineyard and that's how I happened to go to Martha's Vineyard. Now, I was, uh, here's the thing. We had two sharks, one that went left to right and one, and there was towed 300 feet. Then we had one that was on a platform that Bob had barrels and it would sink and it had a track on it and it had this arm that came up and so the shark could it we could really pinpoint where it goes the others were just drive-bys but i needed 25 feet of depth so the thing you know uh, the shark would come up and i needed a low tide because if the tide was too big we would see all the mechanics or we wouldn't see the shark and in the, the west coast the tides were like 12 feet when i got to martha's vineyard and i saw you know, Edgar Town and Menemsha. And I saw this bay and I checked it out. It was 25 feet and the tide was two feet. <laughs> wow. And I said, perfect. This is it. It's perfect. Well, I thought it was perfect. And, it, it, and uh, our problem was this that what we started building, working on the shark, probably the meeting was in October of 73. The guys putting the guys together and get a place to build it outside the lot. Uh, it was probably mid-November, late November, when we started putting the thing together and making this big sculpture. December, December 17th, Matt, Matt found it in his book, exactly when I went there. Hmm. Uh, I went to Martha's Vineyard. And uh, so that was all good until February of 74, and the book came out. And then the studio said, we got to start shooting this in two months. And there lies the problem. The guys had four or five months before we stoked to shoot the shark when we didn't have the year, year and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but your responsibilities, not only have you got these broad things like where we're going to shoot it, how the shark's going to look, your, your job is to kind of... Well, was it wasn't it Rod Serling said, I write the words, you make them happen. I mean that's what you that's what your job is, isn't it? You you make those words happen. And that that set of Quint's shack there, Carl Gottlieb called it a masterpiece of a set, you know, that smelt of blood and bone and and it tells so much about that character. As soon as we see him sitting there in front of that blackboard, we're kinda of, who is this guy? Is he is he the real deal? And then we see his shack. And we know he's the real deal because of all of that amazing set decoration you did. Where did, where do you begin to dress a set like that and, and decide how that set's going to look? Well, th th this is great. You know, John Dwyer was a set decorator, and I worked with John on many night galleries. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's really old time set decorating. Most of the time. You know, I work with set decorators. Some of them are just skimpy. They just put, others put so much that you go in and you take stuff out. 
which I like better because then you got more choices. John really loaded it up. I mean, he found more shark heads, more, you know, and teeth and stuff. And, and he was great. Uh, so the, what I wanted, and I got a little trouble for it because when I saw him in M show, and I'll never forget, I thought, my God, David Lean would have built this whole peninsula, you know, uh, because had all these little fishing shacks. But then right at the very, both sides, right, right at the end, there was an empty lot. And I thought, perfect for Quint, and I'm going to make it bigger, you know, because that's Quint. All these other fishermen, the little guys, he's the master. So um, I had a lot of problems. I had to make a model, which I made a lot of models, and to take it to, to uh, Boston and get a, a permit to build it. Uh, and, and then the selectmen, there's all these selectmen in Martha's Vineyard, and they said, oh, you're making it too high. It, there's a restriction of size. I said, well, it's not a real building, it's a set. We're gonna shoot it and then we could tear it down. And uh, they said, okay. We had to put a $500,000 bond that we would tear it down. And that's a lot of money. Wow. I mean, the movie budget is like 4 million, you know? It's talking about half a million. Anyway, um, I'm all ready to build it. And I've got uh, a, a big uh, like telephone pole thing, you know, it's going into the water. And a guy comes and he stops. He says, you got to stop. You, you can't put that in the water. I said, why? Well, that's a violation of that you need a different permit. And I said, well, what's going to happen? He says, well, they're, they're going to make you take it out. I said, well, how long is that going to take? Oh, probably about six months after, you know, I said, okay, fine, screw it. <laughs> you know, put the poles down. Uh, so it just kept going like that, you know? Yeah, but yeah. An interesting thing, while I was doing that, there was this guy, uh, Lynn Murphy, a fisherman with a lot of attitude and a voice, rah, 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 rah. you guys are wrecking a thing, blah, blah, blah. I said, you're a fisherman here, a boat guy? Yeah. I said, you know, we need a guy uh, local that could tow the shark, that knows all the waters. Yeah? Yeah, why don't you go talk to the production manager? So that was Lynn Murphy, and he had a young girl who eventually married, uh, Susan Murphy, and he would boss her around, get that rope, do it. Well, Robert Shaw met him, and they go drinking together, and that was the character that he stole. He stole the voice and the attitude from a guy that was at Martha's Vineyard, Lynn Murphy. It's wow. just crazy, you know. Yeah, that's great. Did you ever go for a drink with Robert Shaw? No. Or you are you too you're too sensible not to. <laughs> well, yeah, no. <laughs> I met a very pretty young girl. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I spent whatever time I wasn't working on the set with her. And yeah. she was back, but she was she was the one that pointed shark in the shark in the asteroid, shark in the asteroid. Oh really? Very All cute right. girl. Yeah. yeah we went together cute, for yeah. a number of years. She was much younger than me. But um, you know, but you were on set, you were on location there every day for that whole production that overran and went on and on. What happened was this. Uh, so we didn't have the shark working. Uh, and what, what really was stopping the shark from working a lot was the salt water was getting into the McDonald's. So I would sit on lunchtime with Stephen and we'd go through the whole script. And I started doing the storyboards. There again, they're supposed to hire an illustrator but they now nah, the too cheap. Joe can do it, which was good because they couldn't pay me. They didn't cl claim who did it, so I kept all those. Uh huh. Because the studio used to just get all that stuff, and they used to throw it away too. Yeah, yeah. To stuff. Now they everybody. Thank goodness it. you you did it and kept hold of it. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, basically, um, I would go, we would shoot everything we could without the shark. And I have to explain this to critics. We got every shot that we wanted with the shark. It, when people say, oh, they didn't use the shark enough uh, because it didn't work. If you look at the storyboards, every shot shark that's there, we got. The barrels, oh, they used the barrels because the shark did. No, no, no. The barrels were a Hitchcock thing. 
When the barrel's coming, it goes down. You know what, why it goes down, because the shark's there. So it was Stephen directing, or clever. You know, it's like Chrissy gets eaten, boom. And, uh, and then she gets pulled. You don't see the shark, why? You know there's a, when the wharf goes and turns around and comes at them, why? Because the shark's there. So he wanted the shark to come up when Scheider was coming from this stuff, you know, and uh, we need a bigger boat. So it all in all, you know, it, it worked out quite well. We, uh, we got back to the studio. I, I shot the last day. Uh, there was a, a sequence Stephen wanted to really get back and work with Verna Fields and, and cut the thing. And there was a, a shot with the raft, a kid on the raft, and the shark grabs the raft. Ah, uh, you did that shot. Oh, wow. That shot has haunted me all my life. <laughs> that was my first directing gig. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a hell of a shot. We directing a lot on second unit on, on Jaws 2. But when we got back, we did, in the back way, we did the shot where Dreyfus goes down and he finds uh, the tooth. And then the, the guy, you see the guy in the hole of the head, of Gardner's head. So that was done on the back lot and it was all foggy at night. So that was cool. And we did a couple other shots, but Stephen, they had a screening, uh, sneak screening in, uh, I think it was Texas, it was just the executives and Stephen and, and Stephen came back and he said, uh, Joe, I've got four screams. I think I get five. If I can get the head in the hole to come out more. And while we, we were stopped shooting, we had, there was no money, no point. I says, okay, because I, I like to build things, you know, so, so I said, I'll build the hull. And I built the hull with a hole in it. And uh, he got somebody to sneak out the head from the makeup department. He got an underwater cameraman. And uh, so we had that. And he says, I want another shot of the hull breaking as the shark is going to show me the way to go home, boom, boom. I want to see water splitting, breaking thing. So I, I did that. We did that in my driveway with a hose and Stephen. So as big as this movie was, we got Stephen with a hose and a camera and in my driveway. And then we took the, the, the one with the hole to Verna's swimming pool. I didn't have a swimming pool built yet. And, and so Verna's pool, we clouded up the water and we did that shot. And then uh, we had dailies in the studio were flipped out, Zanica Brown. There's no Jaws dailies, we'll th finish. Well, not quite. <laughs> We've got uh, some more, yeah. <laughs> Stephen and I are working for nothing. You know, we didn't get paid to do this, but we were, um, you know, it was like the, the crew was really tired being on that boat for so long. And the studio, they were, because Stephen, just when we started shooting the water sequence, when I scouted it, it the the the, the basic uh, water area and the beach was covered with snow, and there was nobody out there. But now in June, July, there's people and there's boats coming all over the place, and Stephen wanted them to be isolated with no boats. And he was very firm about that. You know, Quint breaks the radio and there's just three guys and a shark, nobody else. So he was very firm. And the studio, how come he's not shooting? Yeah, he's not shooting. And we used to get boats, send boats, go this way, go that way. You know, some people would cooperate. Okay. Other people say, screw you. I'm going to be where I want. Anyway, it took forever. Not only the shark cut work, all the time, but not having a clear ocean view. And, you know, there were, there were thought about getting rid of Stephen, you know, I mean, it was like, but he was so strong, he'd been at 27, 28 years old, of getting what he thought was right. And I admire him for that. And uh, we, we had a strong relationship with that. And Verna Fields was very strong about it. Verna helped me a lot. Verna actually was cutting the movie with my storyboards there. I've never seen an editor do that. And we're working with Ron and Valerie Taylor 
who did Blue Water White Death. And with, there's a thing in the book where I'm talking to Verna and, and, and the, the tailors about how the shark moves. And uh, Valerie said, Joe, do you, do you move in the tail too much. Just let us swim. Okay. So we were working on how a real shark moved. I had a real ecthyologist help me with the model. So we got it down. So when people say, oh, it, it, we really had, you know, so, so there was a, a group of people. Bill Gilmore, who was a production manager, uh, he came aboard and we had to let the first one go. And with Bill and a, a few people, we we fought through it because the studio was saying, well, maybe we should go someplace else and shoot the water. Maybe we should do this, maybe. We, and actually Dick Zanuck was great too because I had all the storyboards on a big wall in the production office. And when we get a shark shot, he would cross it off. And that was his big thing, coming with a, a, a red marker. So he would tell the studio, he would lie. He'd say, oh yeah, we got so many shots, you know, which we didn't, you know. Uh, but it inched along. And as I say, we got back, we were not heroes. Uh, they threw the sharks in the back lot and let them rot. They sold the boat. Eventually, they had to buy it back for the tour. Uh, and, and just uh, last year, some executive destroyed the boat. Just said, oh, get rid of that old thing. And Stephen, from what I've heard, even in recent years when he was at university, would go there and sit by the boat and just think about his career and relate to the boat. And then some executive just, oh, we don't need that old boat. You know, it's crazy, isn't it? These things are important and clearly important to Stephen to kind of sit there and reflect on a what was a really difficult time for him, and maybe it sort of roots him back to to those to those months. Yeah, out, and, out. and you, you know, it was interesting because we hadn't seen each other for a long time, and last year, last a year ago, February, the Art Directors Guild gave me a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah, congratulations. And uh, so the studio said, "Oh, maybe who's going to introduce you?" And I, I, I said, well, most of them were dead, you know, Bill <laughs> dead. so many people in the field's dead. Uh, said, what about Stephen? I said, oh, Stephen's doing, you know, the show in New York, uh, West Side Story. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to bother him. So Greg Nicotero, uh, we were doing book signing and Greg he did the forward to this. And Greg said, oh, I'll be happy to introduce you. So this, I got to tell you, Jamie, so we're at the thousand people, it's a black tie, or all this stuff. And Greg's talking, he's going to introduce me and how we've been friends for years. And he's a big collector of Jaws stuff. And then they were starting to show a screening of my various movies. And then Spielberg appears. And he, he did this video saying how great it was working with me. What a, <laughs> a terribly hard time we had on Jaws and great time with Close Encounters. Still, he said Close Encounters, still the biggest set he's ever worked on, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I love you, Joe. And, and so uh, that blew me away, you know. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think he is so successful and he's been doing it for so long. I think he reflects back. I did his first television and his first three movies and stuff. So th that was very rewarding, uh, Jamie, to have that. Yeah, I bet. And yeah, being around in those formative years with Stephen, you know, one thing I wanted to say to you, I'm here in London, right? And I've, I, I first saw Jaws when I shouldn't have been watching it. It was on TV here in the UK. I found out the other day, I had a little look back, it premiered on the 8th of October 1981. Of the 56 million people in the UK, 23.3 million watched it that night on TV. Are you are you serious? Yeah, half the population of the country I live in watched that movie. It's got to be one of the biggest TV events ever to have occurred in the UK, I would think. Crazy. But that's the reach that film has, you know. So we've reached the halfway point roughly here. I'll be back chatting with Joe Alves after these messages. Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth podcast. The Projection Booth is single-handedly the greatest film podcast you could ever listen to or could possibly want. Top notch. Five stars. This has quickly become one of my favorite film-related podcasts. Always interesting. A completely unpretentious yet fully comprehensive look at films from all genres. The Projection Booth Podcast, with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. It, it was 
amazing because for the last century, you know, I would hear people talk about Jaws and stuff. And then we did a thing in Martha's Vineyard, probably 2002 or something like that. We had various people there and Jim Beller and somebody said, oh, you should sell some of your storyboards. You know, these guys that I sell. And I said, really? People are interested? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? So I, you know, I sold some for 20, some for 50 if I did a, a, a real, like this, I do a, a real short original. Anyway, um, but it just increased, you know, then I started doing these shows, you know, in various places. And, uh, and uh, of course, this, this last year, I get almost every day, uh, would you sign this, would you do that? Now, last week, a guy brought 150 things for me to sign. There, there, <laughs> There's a, it's a, a day's a job, work. Little cartoon shark it comes in a package, and I sign the plastic thing. And so these people sell it. So the, yeah, they I made money off of that. The day before, there was this guy, I guess very wealthy, wants to do something on Jaws, and uh, Chris Marr, who's the sculptor who did uh, a, a lifetime uh, Quint that we we had for. Uh, Greg Nicotero's company, and he did the three characters for the Catalina Island. So anyway, he's involved with this guy, and he got the chalkboard, big chalkboard. And the guy wanted me to draw the original, you know, shark on the chalkboard. Was that you that drew that originally then on the board? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. Well, I did an earlier one, and then we could see that it was being erased. Steven said, no, I, I want something more simplistic, you know, because mine was uh, a shark coming at you. This one is just, you know, a profile with a little character in it. So anyway, the last week was that and signing. And I'm thinking it must be the pandemic that people have nothing else to do, you know? <laughs> I don't know about that. I think it's, you know, it's one of those films that's going to live on and on and on. It, are you okay to talk about Close Encounters a bit as well, Joe? Is that okay? Yeah. So... With Jaws, you worked in like a real town and you worked in open water. For Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you worked in a, a more controlled studio environment. Do you think Stephen did that because of his experiences on Jaws or was it purely because the script called for it? The scope of the script, if you like. Stephen and I, would be, where he was cutting Jaws, we took a break and we went skiing. And they might had a, a, a condo up in um, Mammoth Ski Lodge. And we got snowed in, and he, and he was going to do Bingo Long and the Traveling All Stars uh, about black baseball in the 30s. So I, I brought a bunch of research to talk about that, Life magazines of the period and stuff. And he started talking about this script he's writing called Watch the Sky. And Dr. Alan Hynek's book, UFO Scientific Inquiry, about UFOs. And he started saying this and that. And I said, boy, that. That sounds more interesting than this black baseball movie. He said, yeah, but I don't have a deal. I said, okay. Well, a couple of weeks later, I get a call from John Badham, who's a director I worked with quite a bit on Night Gallery and a couple of movies. And John said, I got this movie I'm going to do called Bingo Long and His Traveling All Stars. Oh, well, I guess Steven's not doing it, you know. In any case, I, I had committed to do a thing called Embryo with Rock Hudson. Small movie, but uh, so I, I was doing Embryo. And then uh, Stephen, after I finished that, Stephen called me and he said, uh, we got a deal with Columbia, with uh, see uh, Julia and Michael Phillips, who are the producers, and they did the sting. So they had some clout to get this thing done. So basically he said, go talk to John Beach, who's the head of production at Columbia, and he'll tell you what's happening. So here again, I'm starting on a movie. Nobody else is on it. Uh, I mean, Stephen is, he's working on the script and Julia, but I mean, nobody that's physically doing, you know, going out. And John says, look, at, uh, we're gonna shoot all this on uh, a studio soundstage and on the back lot here. So it's all controlled, see, it's, and uh, except we need one location, a, a weird mountain. So I got a map of U, uh, scenic USA and they had ship rock, chimney rock, all these various rocks. 
the National Monument is back of that where they have the, the, the president's heads. And Carl Gottlieb, remember uh, Verna Fields became, she's older. She went from editor, won the Academy Award. She became uh, a, uh, an executive vice president of Universal. She had an office and then she had a spare office, which guys would go hang out, you know, people that knew her. So uh, I would go there sometimes just read a script or break it down. And Carl, and I had my map and I was looking at this and Carl said, oh, look at the Devil's Tower is pretty interesting, I think. He said, you should try that. So I, I drove 3000 miles. And I mentioned at, at my war dinner thing, I said to the art directors, I said, today you just Google it. I mean, you can, you could just show me mountains, you know, clarity, show me strange mountains, you know. But in those days you drove and I didn't have anybody hired. There's no location manager yet. I just drove until, and I, Shiprock was good. Uh, and, but then, I got to Gillette, Wyoming, and I started driving, and I see, go over this hill, I see this little triangle thing, and not triangle, but a little peak, and I, it disappears, like, and then it gets bigger, and then I get there, and it's incredible. I mean, it was like a spacey looking thing. And I had taken pictures, pan shots, you know, with camera and film, and then you glue them all together, and I showed Stephen, even though I knew that was best, you still want to give the director options, you know, so I was here's Shiprock, here's you know, oh he's Devil's Tower by far, you know. And would you have photographed that from different locations around it to show him what the range of shots he could get were? Like oh, yeah. when you took notes and everything and oh, oh yeah. What when you scout, you, you do pretty much pan shots, you know, of the whole area and some detailed shots. And then you you this is what's interesting. I, I scouted for close encounters in India uh, for some strange looking things. But you, you don't know what you got until you come home. So you come back home with a sack full of film, then you gotta wait days till they develop it. And then you hope like hell that it worked. Where today you go click, oh, that looks good. Oh, oh no, I don't like that. I mean, it's, it's such a different world, you know? I mean, no cell phones. I mean, you know, not, you know. so anyway, uh, we get back and uh, season loves that. And now in the script, what he has is that strange mountains here. And then he has just the military, like a military encampment with just tents and stuff. And then the spaceship comes down there. And we're talking, and I said, you know, this spaceship comes down, it's all very technical stuff. We really should have technical equipment there to read what, the, and he says, yeah, I said, what about if I build an arena, you know? And uh, and he says, yeah, that, that would be cool. Okay, so I built an arena because John V says you could have stage 15 and 16, two biggest stages that connect and where they shot Camelot. And so that would be your, so like a big deal. So I make a, a model and uh, to, to fit in that, size of stage. And now Jaws has come out. Now, this is a big thing because they've got the director of now this big successful movie and we're making this small little sci-fi movie and Columbia is having financial problems. There is some kind of Beagle Man is some corrupt stuff. So they want a big movie. And now they got this young director that made a big movie. So they all come to look at my model. It's going to fit on stage 15, 16. And I showed it to them. They said, oh, I was in this spaceship. I, and they said, "Is there, so you got a problem with it? I said, well, yeah, I think it should be four times that big. Really? I said, yeah, because, you know, it's such an important event. I mean, just think about it. You know, Francois Truffaut was going all over finding these things. And you finally come to this area. And it's this big arena, you know. And the arena had to be done inside because uh, Doug Trouble is coming on to do the effects. And he, he had done 2001, you know, movie. The high level guy. And it all had to be covered with black so he could control the lighting. So uh, I make a model four times 
And I show it to the executives again and the producer. And, and they said, oh, this is great, you know, because now a little golf cart is just a little thing. I have no cars for size. I just want big, you know, important, an important event. When Melinda Dillon and Dreyfus walks over that hill. And incidentally, that hill that they walk over, today would be green screen, like what's behind you. No. I built a mountain, seven stories on rollers, you know, that we could use in front of a 125 foot projection screen. And so that's what they wrote. I mean, it, it just- Because I, I didn't even realize that road was a set I, um, for years. Yeah, well, the I, road I just, that they yeah. that he goes up. Yeah, yeah that was, I had no idea. Just, okay, that was in the sex states. Anyway, so Clark Palo is now the production manager, really super nice guy. So Clark and I, okay, where are you gonna shoot this? And I don't have a clue. Shoot. Okay. It's so big. Um, how about airplane hangers from World War II? You know? So I go up to Oregon. And big, big hangers. But half of it is being used by a lumber company. <laughs> Saws going, oh, that's not going to. I go to North Carolina for another one. And up to Wyoming for another one. And they cheat the size. No, that's not big enough. And then somebody tells me about this thing in Mobile, Alabama two hangers that they're not using. And I go there uh, with Clark and uh, they're big, but they're 300 foot square and uh, side by side, but the door opens up all the way. I said, okay, I can add another 150 feet to that. I mean, it's unbelievable with scaffolding and all that stuff. So that's where we decide to do it. And then the next stage is where I built the road that they could drive through one door and out the door at 45 miles an hour. So uh, basically, that's, uh, that's how Close Encounters started with the, the size and the scope. And then we shot a lot of other stuff uh, in Mobile, Alabama, because uh, it was supposed to look like uh, Ohio. And uh, Stephen said, well, we could go back home and shoot all the uh, neary uh, house stuff. I said, well, no, LA stuff all has fences. This, we don't want a fence because he's doing barbecue and you can see the neighbors down here. And when he goes crazy, then everybody's looking. So you need an open thing. So basically, this is funny. So I found this area in Mobile, Alabama, where they were building these new houses. It was all open. So we found the house we wanted. And, uh, but nobody owned it. It was a company thing. And so uh, Mark, uh, Clark and I said, okay, well, we'll buy it and rent it to the studio. And then the studio said, because they didn't, they wouldn't buy it. And then they said, wait, wait a minute, you guys are going to buy it? Well, if you're going to buy it, then we're going to buy it. You know, they bought it and then they sold it. And, uh, but uh, yeah, there was a, Close Encounters is quite interesting. Uh, being English, you might have, I, 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 <laughs> When we were, because George Lucas came on the set and he said, oh my God, we never built anything like this. We just built the same, the set and repainted it for Star Wars. So I was up for the Academy Award against Star Wars, who were two English designers and they won the Academy Award. And now I'm up for the BAFTA, for the British Academy Award against the two English and I won. <laughs> and it, was, it was just funny. It's not that there were, it was this, it was that there was a lot of visual effects uh, in, in Star Wars. And I think people got that confused with the production design, you know? Yeah, I think you, when you see Star Wars, you, you kind of understand that it's an invented universe. Whereas when you watch Close Encounters, you think it's Earth, therefore there yeah. is no design. But the fact is, there's so much design gone into it, so much thought gone into it. I mean, I can't even imagine even how you would begin to break down a script like that on Close Encounters from a production design point of view. I mean, you must have an amazing mind. Like you said, you know, we can't have fences because there's that scene. You must have to know the script kind of inside out. Oh, yeah. Well, well you know, um, as you could see on, on this book, on Jaws, they're page by page, you know, th that I go through. And you go through, I don't know where that section is. Yeah, right near the back, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, all this. And I, I didn't know why Dennis was going to put it, because he didn't put it in the first book. 
But when you go through it, this is how a designer, I know today they do it on a computer. But for example, I'm just reading a script and then you see I made a few little sketches there, mm, little mm. thoughts. Mm, Those are yeah. thoughts. So when you're, you're breaking it down from a visual point of view, you say, oh, this is maybe make a little note, you know. Um, but, you, you know, let me just say, from having done Night Gallery, where I used to have to do sometimes 20 sets a week, you know, you'd find stuff on the lot and you'd find doors and stuff. So you're just thinking all the time visually, you know, after work, I'd go have a drink and I'm thinking, let's see, I'm, I need a big staircase there. I think there's one on such, you know, and then you make a note. And But it, with this, of course, we had to pretty well build everything, you know, and so I had a, a great, uh, Bill Parks, uh, he was an old CB in World War II and, uh, he was a great commander. He always called me Mr. L as he smoked a pipe. And, and uh, I mean, it, it is amazing. And then the, the, the mothership that comes down. Now, Trumbull did the animated one, but we built one 80 feet, mirrored mylar, you know, and then uh, it was really interesting. If you look, I had a, I hired, hired an incredible illustrator, George Jensen. And, I wish I had the, that book here. Um, the, the illustrations reflected so much how Vilmos was going to light it, you know? And so when the spaceship come down and like 3,000 photo floods hit the mirror and then the kids come down and the smoke, that was, a, was a lot of thought, you know, in that. Uh, to, to do an execution and, and we were there for quite a while you know light light is crucial to the whole look of that film isn't it from you know Trumbull special effects to your on-set stuff how did you sort of approach that use of light sources in that scene in particular obviously we're we're now all familiar with that kind of iconic look of the beams of light coming out well it was interesting uh and we have 48 arcs arcs uh, in, in the hangar, there was a, a, an a, a area up above where they we could have, where we needed a, an L, a electrician for each arc. Um, when uh, George did the illustrations, I mean, he really captured that mood, you know. Uh, and then I think once, because Vilmos had a hard time, Vilmos was not a lighting cameraman. He, he, was, he was an, you know, pretty much a location guy, really good with reflectors and stuff. But now suddenly he would, and the first day or two of shooting, it was like black. It was just, and, and he was learning and developing, you know, uh, and, and of course, George's illustrations, and it was shown to Stephen, I said, this is the light effect. And it was interesting because after that, a lot of backlight was used, you know, in movies. We, we, where you just flood flooded back here, so you're w working with sh shadows and light reflection. It was it was quite an experience, and and Vilmos won the Academy Award for it. You know, yeah. Stephen uh, was we were in my office. I I said Stephen, I got an idea about the mothership. He says okay, so I put on the music to Space Odyssey. You know, turn the lights off. I got my desk lamp. You know. And I set it down and I said, the mothership comes down and then it starts to lift up and you see this surgical slit of light. And that's important, surgical slit of light. Now, that means when I do this, that's gotta be straight. It can't be wood. I had to make that out of metal because I had two metal things 80 feet long and when I did that, you know, it showed him the light, the thing comes up and it's all dark. And then you see this, shoo. he said, okay, that's great. How are we going to do it? I said, well, we'll figure that out next. You know, <laughs> but, uh, we needed a lot of light and we needed it to come down in two pieces. So we had two cranes, one crane to lower the whole thing and then another crane to lower the, uh, raise this one. So. Rory Arbogast was the head of uh, visual effects on that movie. Uh, he was, he did all the skins and stuff for the first Jaws, you know. Anyway, yeah, that's how that came about. 
<laughs> I, I was just thinking that, you know, it, it, there's something in you and in Stephen that drives you forward, that motivates you forward. Because each time you're doing something, you know, you're doing it for the first time. In, in some ways, it's sort of reminding me of the script of Close Encounters. It's like this irrational faith that he's going to get to this point, you know, where he's going to get the answers. And, you know, coming up with an idea as simple as your your desk lamp idea, but then having to create, you know, an 80 foot wide metal structure to achieve that. I mean, how do you how do you stay motivated in that situation and, and confident that you're going to reach that that goal? Interesting. You know, hmm. I had a, a young couple write me, you know, they generally would you sign this, but they they they, uh, they they said what what's your great, greatest memory or, you know and then what what is your advice well the greater memory i had a lot of great memories but probably the, the first biggest one was our, our second screen of jaws where i thought everybody was going to laugh at the shark and they screamed and and then the executives they went in the bathroom and they said we got to make this a big release and and i'll never forget that moment um and as far as advice, I say, you know, don't give up on your ideas. Be persistent. And uh, I guess I had a reputation for being a little bit of hard nose, you know, I mean, we've got to do it. I think that was all going back to Nike. We, when I was a staff art director, some guys would do, you know, weekly television shows uh, where they did a minimum amount of work. They'd get to work, they'd check the set, they'd do a thing, go have their coffee, and go back and read the paper, you know, until they had to go check the set again. When I had got Night Gallery, and I worked for some pretty good art directors too, that I worked for Frank Arrigo, who was, he used to be a boxer, and he was a persistent guy. He was like, we're going to do it, you know. I mean, we worked, I did a thing with him, Alfred Hitchcock, Torn Curtain, and working with Hitch was, you really had to be on top of it. And Hitch was was an art director in England before he became a director. And so with Hitch, you know, you better do it and you do it right. And Hitchcock said one time, he called me up, he says, oh, I want you to do this. And Mr. Newman comes, runs down the stairs, he goes over to the registration desk and leaves. And I said, okay, uh, Mr. Hitchcock, some people call him Hitch, I call him Mr. Hitchcock. And, and I said, okay, but what about the reverse shot? Or what about this? No, no, no. He comes to the desk and he leaves. So you build just that. And so with Frank, Frank also had directed stuff uh, at a smaller television before he went back to art directing, is you build what you need, you know, and you build as, as good as, as detailed as possible. You don't put four bad walls, you put two good walls if that's all you got. And that's what I learned with Night Gallery you know, is, is give them, this is what you're going to shoot, make it as much quality as a feature, you know. So Frank sort of taught me about being steadfast, you know. I know we're a little over budget, but we got to do it and it's going to be great and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Where some people just back off. Oh, you don't want that? Oh, okay. Here's a wall, you know, it's green, whatever. Uh, so I, I think I learned a lot from Frank because he taught me how to be a production designer as a director would think. Think of what the script says, what the shot needs. Just don't build all the stuff that you never see. You know, some directors will never tell you what they want. They just want to come in and you build all this stuff and then you don't see half of it. It's a waste of money. You know, the, the idea that if you could do storyboards and you could say, this is what we're going to shoot and the director agrees. And that's what was Steven, you know, I mean, Steven would shoot, he'd vary a little bit, you know, he could do stuff, but yeah, steadfast. <laughs> and and bloody mindedness. Yeah, just keep going, keep pushing. Um, I, I'm aware that I'm, I've gone over the hour here. Just got one more question for you, Joe, if that's cool. When, when people think of Jaws, they draw the shark, right? When people think of Close Encounters, they draw Devil's Tower, or they think of the light board. Now, you had a big involvement in coming up with well you know the the stadium for a start so didn't Spielberg want it to land between f two fast food restaurants or something and then you came up with the stadium idea and then you come up with a light board as well I mean these things are yeah, so I iconic know, Joe I, I, how do you I, come up with it uh, the spaceship land between McDonald's and Jack in the Box and he had that idea for 
a short time, you know. I said, okay, I'll make a model of a, of a Jack in the Box and a thing. And, you know, and then he goes, nah, forget it. <laughs> you know, the light board, because I played piano. So I wanted music and, and, and sound. Okay, so you don't go in the piano, eight notes. No, you go the full 12. So you go C, C sharp, you know, E, D, D sharp. So that's 12 units, okay? So I put 12 little boxes, you know, rectangles kind of thing. Now, all right, so that's it. That's middle C, bum, over here. Goes over to B flat, which is a, right? And that covers all my boxes. Now that's a normal sound. But now if you want to go high, so then you go lighter, you go darker. So then I had this incredible board with 72 wires. So you could play it on the piano. You want to C major. So bah, 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 bah. so I did all that, <sighs> except when Trumbull got a hold of it, then he just did it the way he wanted to do it. So you, you sometimes do these things with great effort and you could play it, but then he thought he would just do it electronically, you know, visually uh, with uh, whatever CGI they had at the time. I know one guy came when I was building a big city. He said, oh, you don't have to build this. We'll do it in CGI. I said, what's CGI? Oh, it's this, you know, electric, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it would turn. 72 hours to make one shot, you know, so that was a bad idea at that time. So I had a good and not so good relationship with Trumbull because as he got more important, as we wrapped, he took over a little bit more. And to the point that they actually did a special edition of Close Encounters. And Stephen released that and then he didn't like it. It was overdone. I mean, Oh, I know. Here's what I didn't like with what Trouble did. When Dreyfus goes into the spaceship and it closes up and the little boy says goodbye, it's goodbye. But no, he had to go in and then you see all these creatures hanging. And I thought, why? You know, and I think Stephen realized you took the mystery away. You know, what are you going to do? You know, um, and it reminded me of... Um, a hotel in, in uh, Atlanta that you walk in the lobby and, and you see all the, uh, the various balconies, you know, and that's what it looked like, balconies with these little weird people looking down. Um, so I was a little unhappy with that. And then uh, Stephen, uh, you know, uh, changed it. And it, it got a little rough he, he, with Bill Walsh and Stephen towards the end. And, and Trumbull did have a lot more influence, you know, and uh, it, it, it went off in a different direction for a while. But then it came back because I think that that Indian is so good with the little boy, you know, yeah. waving goodbye. I agree. And also it gives um, the, the audience something to talk about. Like, imagine, I wonder what's in there. And, you know, it sparks imagination. I don't want to see in there. Another Hitchcock kind of thing. Don't show everything. You leave it with, oh, and where's, where's Dreyfus going to go? I mean, you know, I, I mean, it's, are you going to have a sequel? You know, he's off in some space, you know, place. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that never happened. Yeah. Well, Joe, listen, I'm, I'm, I've taken an hour and a quarter of your time here, so I'm very, very grateful to you. And I just want to say, you know, from the bottom of my heart that these films mean a lot to me and they mean a lot to a lot of people. And for a lot of people of my generation who are in the industry, I'm in television myself, I think a lot of people have been so inspired by your work. And I know you, you said earlier that you're amazed that people are still talking about this stuff, but it still, yeah, yeah. Mat it still matters to people. It's still such a big deal. So I'm, I'm so grateful to you for that and, and for your time as well. And I appreciate the British Academy Award. It's just up in my mantle, you know. Yeah. yeah it, it, was, it was a great time. Okay. Well, it was nice talking to you. Thanks, Joe. Take care. Appreciate it. Take care.
I hope you enjoyed my chat with Joe Alves there. If you didn't already know, Joe went on to direct tons of Jaws second unit, as well as uh, helming Jaws 3D, a film I've not revisited since I was a kid. Thanks to my friend Paddy Tindall for sending me some clips of it over WhatsApp just before I interviewed Joe to remind me why I haven't watched it again and why I probably shouldn't bring it up with Joe. A huge thanks to my patrons on Patreon. I genuinely couldn't do this without you. If any of you other listeners out there have enjoyed either my podcast or my videos, please consider becoming part of the Film Inventories family on patreon.com forward slash Jamie Benning. If you've ever thought I'd buy that Jamie Bloke a beer or I'd like to talk movies with him over a coffee, then that's really all it will cost to become a patron and part of the Film Inventories family. I've added a new $1 per creation tier recently. And remember, you can set a monthly limit as well. I doubt if I'll ever get more than three or four things out in one month. But if you want to limit that, you can limit your, your contribution by setting that monthly limit. And of course, I have released some of my creations without charging patrons as a thank you now and again, and I'll continue to do that. Those that can afford it are the ones helping me to make these podcasts and videos, and you benefit from that too. Thanks to my two new patrons that have joined since the start of 2021. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and maybe even leave a nice comment. It all helps. It really, really, really does help. That's how I'm going to get eyes and ears on this podcast, so I do appreciate that. Next episode is already recorded. I just need to edit it. I spoke with production designer, now director, Gavin Rothery. He worked with Duncan Jones on Moon as a VFX supervisor and production designer and has recently released his directorial feature debut called Archive. Do check that out on uh, various streaming platforms. Um, he really has pulled off an incredible feat despite the small budget. It's a pretty cool film, actually. There's some really good, really good moments in there. And um, I'm pretty sure if you like the films that I like, then you're going to enjoy it. Gav is a real creative force of nature and I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to my chat with him next time around. Thanks again for listening and I'll be back soon for the next episode of the Filmumentaries podcast.